Melchizedek was sent by God to teach the people who lived during the early times concerning how people should conduct themselves before a holy God, before a righteous God, before a God of justice, before a God who is an all-consuming fire. Now, one of the duties of a priest, we have a general idea about a priest because we the, the idea of a priest in our mind is what we see in the Old Testament. He is always offering sacrifices. So, one of the duties of a priest is to offer sacrifices. That is his duty. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that a New Testament priest is also required to offer sacrifices. See, just when you all thought that uh, all have been done away with when the Lord Jesus was nailed on the cross, which is not true because the Bible says a New Testament believer must offer sacrifices. And the New Testament sacrifice is called spiritual sacrifice so it has got no connection to the goats the bulls the turtle doves and all those stuffs no this is called spiritual sacrifices and these spiritual sacrifices the bible tells us in uh, okay turn your bibles with me to first peter chapter 2 verse 5 you also as living stones are been built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to pay attention to two important words in this scripture. Number one, offer spiritual sacrifices. And number two, look at the word there, acceptable to God. So, which means the sacrifices that we are to offer, although you can offer the right sacrifices, it must be acceptable to God. So, many times we are offering offerings to God. See, when you give money as an offering, it is a sacrifice because the money represents you. If you give out of your abundance, that is not a sacrifice. Because you have too much and out of the too much, you give little. That's what most people do. Out of the too much, they give little. That is not a sacrifice. But when you give out of the abundance of your heart, when it pinches you, then it is a sacrificial offering that you are giving to God. Because you, you are really emptying yourselves or you are giving more than what you could really afford and you are denying yourself something then you are giving then that becomes a sacrificial offering that is an offering and even then it must be acceptable to God many times we are giving we are doing some things and we find that there are no returns coming back to us because the scripture says if you give, it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, overflowing. Right? But we find many times that we are poorer than after than we were before we gave. And the reason is because two things. We are not sowing in the right ground. That's problem number one. Secondly, the sacrifice we gave was not acceptable to God. So, when it was not acceptable to God, how can he give increase? He cannot give increase because your offering was rejected. So, our spiritual sacrifices that we offer now, since we are now priests of the order of the Melchizedek, we must learn how to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Your sacrifice must be acceptable. Now look at the word acceptable. The word acceptable in the Greek is 
ए यू पी आर ओ एस बी ई के टी ओ एस यू प्रोस डेक्टोस ओके आई होप इट्स राइट के वट डज दिस वर्ड मीन्स वेल रिसीव्ड दैट इज अप्रूफ्ड और फेवरेबल so the word acceptable means it is well received by god accept a well receive and god approves it and as a result you will find favor in the eyes of god so that's what acceptable means now let's look at an example in genesis chapter 4 verse 3 to 7 we read about cain offering a sacrifice and able offering a sacrifice and we read that god accepted the offering of abel but he rejected the offering or the sacrifices that came offered and as a result cain was very very angry verse 6 so the lord said to cain why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen if you do well will you not be accepted now look at the scripture it says there if you had offered the right sacrifice wouldn't your offering be accepted now this is god is saying your offering was not accepted because you had not done right what did he do wrong because if you look at these two brothers one was a farmer the older brother was a farmer and the other brother the younger brother was a shepherd so the farmer brought his first fruit all the vegetables all the kangkong all the tauge <laughs> now see in future all this will be edited out <laughs> <laughs> so all the kangkong all the kobe all the long beans all the stuff he brought before god and uh, able he brought a sheep the best of the best and he offered now the reason why able's sacrifice was accepted because the bible says this is a command from god in leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 and hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins so for a sin offering blood must be shed and abel did that whereas cain did not shed blood i'm sure when you are eating vegetable do you see blood coming out <laughs> no right when you eat when you eat hamburger you may see sometimes blood right even fish sometimes have blood they all are living but vegetables have no blood may right everybody yes. ah so that was rejected because it was not a blood sacrifice this is the only reason why it was rejected so this brings us to another point which is cain deliberately defied the order that was spoken or thought to them how to offer a sacrifice so melchizedek what had already taught them all that abel that's why abel did the right sacrifice but cain deliberately his heart was stubborn see now that boils back to the heart heart attitude the attitude of your heart see his heart attitude was in rebellion why should i go to my brother and take his sheep see the brothers already was having a problem so why should i go to him why should i take from him i'm the older he is the younger he should come to me i'm sure you also have this problem in your home right <laughs> ah, every if you don't have this problem there's something wrong with your family <laughs> <laughs> yes i mean <laughs> they all have, every family have this problem the only family that have no such problems are the single child family <laughs> anyway so the offering that we give must be acceptable unto god 
And furthermore, the Bible tells us in John chapter 4, verse 23, the Lord Jesus himself said, God is looking for true worshippers. So the worshippers of the Melchizedek order must be true worshippers and not just false worshippers. See, there are two kinds of worshippers in the church. True worshippers and false worshippers. How can we identify the true worshippers from the false worshippers? The Lord Jesus himself gave us the answer. The true worshippers are they who worship God in spirit and in truth. And the false worshippers are not worshipping God in spirit and truth at all. They just come to church. I don't know sometimes why they come. They just sit down there and they stare at the blank wall. Their, their heart is not there. Their mind is not there. They are not just paying attention. Just they are mucking attendance. They are not mucking attendance, no. The, they come there to, for the pastor to mark attendance. Yes, pastor, I am here. You know, if, if in peace times, if our heart attitude is like that, what will we do when the Antichrist is going to rule this world? When you will be forced to make a decision, with whom you will follow? The true living God or the false Christ? If today, you have not strengthened the things that will remain, the things that the only thing that will remain forever is your faith, nothing else. Everything else will fall down. All your wealth will become zeros because that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He will introduce a new banking system, a new identity card will be given for everybody, a new everything will become new, will all become part of the global citizens. We are already seeing signs of that everywhere now. Everybody will become globe, citizens of the world. No more citizen of one nation. And you, there will be one standard ID for everybody. You all lock on to one main database. Anything you want to do must use that pass. It is called empty pass. <laughs> See, we have Singh Pass, we have Euro Pass, US Pass, Anti Pass, Anti Christ Government Pass, uh, Anti Pass. So everybody will be given one. But, you know, this is marvels of technology that's going to come. Some years ago, I was meditating the scripture about the image that the beast is going to create. And it, the scripture says, now, all this while, most preachers, including me, have been preaching that he will erect a huge statue and then the statue somehow will become alive, like Frankenstein. <laughs> and then everybody have to bow down and worship that Frankenstein. This was what everybody had taught. This is what, this is an old Pentecostal teaching. And I've been part of that. But just about, I think, two or three years ago, I was meditating the scripture, said, this does not make sense. So what is this scripture really about? What is it going to happen? You know, we, we are moving towards advancement in technology. When we are moving towards advancement in technology, how can the Antichrist be so old-fashioned, make a statue? <laughs> Am I right? Make a statue and then, and then say, G -g 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 <laughs> became alive. He's alive. He's alive. Like Frankenstein, you know, <laughs> cannot be right. <laughs> so this was the quest that I had. So I began to ponder and pray and ask God, Lord, there must be something more than all this. That's when the Lord showed me, it is AI technology. This was revealed way before there is a flurry of interest in AI right now. AI technology, where now you look at robots, they are very, very human, right? Very human, lifelike, and 
a robot has now become the first citizen of Saudi Arabia. Yes. Right? Yes. I, you know, can you imagine it's a robot, but it has become a citizen with the ability to think. But AI right now is still at its infant stage. But for it to think, to decide, and then to make a decision, AI is going to become very, very advanced. Look at the, you know, in China now, they have cameras all over the city. Have you, have you heard of that? Yes. And the camera is always studying the eyes, the facial, it's called a facial recognition system. They can study you and then detect a criminal before he commits a crime. Yeah, before the criminal commits a crime, it will study you, pick you, and alert the police to go and arrest you before you commit your crime. <laughs> ah. You don't laugh. This is biblical, you know. Why is biblical? Because before you commit adultery, you think in your heart to commit adultery. <laughs> so the, the government of the world, well, before you commit robbery, you already thought in your heart, we saw it on your face. So we arrest you, put You know, as good as it may seem on one side, but it is very evil. All this is part, is all part and parcel of the Antichrist world government. You look at all the technology, technology around you, it is telling you that we are closer and closer to the coming of the Antichrist government. So, be careful, on one side technology is good, but on another side, it is going to be the master that is going to rule the universe. So, the heart attitude is very, very important. So, in good times, you must learn how to be a strong believer, how to be a true worshipper of the living God. If you do not build a good relationship with God during peace times, and when the Antichrist is here, there is no time for you to build a relationship. There's no time because you will be like hunted animal. We will be more concerned about survival than trying to build up your spiritual life. You won't have time then. Because no pastors will be there. No teachers will be there. No meetings like this will be there. Nothing will be there. You are all alone. No Bible. Famine of the word. What are you going to do? Don't think you'll have your mobile devices. No power to charge. Yeah. Ah, to, to charge, you need mark on your hand. Because it will be wireless charging. Ah. See, I, I didn't go into greater detail all of that which the Lord revealed to me 10 years ago how this technology was going to be, how communication is going to be. You know, it's all going to be thought communication. Today, you, that's why the wireless technology is improving so much and people are becoming more dependent on Bluetooth and wireless technology. That very Bluetooth wireless technology will be part of the chip. So your communication, you don't even have to type any email. You think it will be sent to the person. That's how communication is going to be during the Antichrist government. It's all with a chip in your body. Hmm. So good or bad? Oh. I didn't say it. You all said it. Huh? But remember, a lot of people ask me this question, you know. So it's taking a credit card or Nets card or this card or that card or even in India they've got a card called the other card. Is it good or bad? As long as it is a card, we are safe. Go as far as technology goes. But the moment the card becomes a chip, then you be alert. Then you stay away as far as you can. Never, never be a partaker of it no matter how spiritual it can be put forth by some theologians. Because a group of theologians will arise in the last days. 
they are the false teachers they are the false prophet who will teach and prophesy that all this is good they will certainly do that and that's when a big chunk the good believers will all swing over to the other side and there will be only a remnant the sheep because only the sheep will hear the lord's voice the good will not hear see that's why you must be a sheep not only a sheep but also train your ears to listen so a priest must offer spiritual sacrifices before a priest can offer spiritual sacrifices there is one very important criteria that is required out of a priest what is the criteria the heart attitude of the priest when the priest comes to offer sacrifices firstly it's not just the sacrifices that must be acceptable the priest himself must first be acceptable if the priest is not acceptable what good is the right sacrifices you can offer it it doesn't serve any purpose you know you can bring the right sacrifices you can be theologically scripturally right with the right sacrifices but if the priest himself is disqualified if the priest himself is unacceptable then all the right sacrifices are a waste so the most important is the heart attitude of the priest the priest should have three heart attitudes number 1 pure heart his heart must be pure his heart must be undefiled his heart must be untainted cannot be tainted it must be pure of defilement number 2 he must have an obedient spirit so his attitude must be one of obedience is whatever god tells you to do you do without any buts ifs whys all that you must get rid out of your vocabulary so a good way to get rid of all that is first practice in your home if your parents say anything never ask why never ask but never ask if so first you practice at home once you practice at home you get used to it so once you are used to at home then next time when god says anything to you you will practice the same thing with god because after all he is your big papa right so before you can obey the big papa you must obey the natural papa natural mama natural papa am i right everybody yes. because the bible tells us no if you cannot love a human being whom you sees with your eyes how can you say you love god whom you cannot see with your eyes so first practice at home so that also goes true for the elderly who are papa mama now you have your grandpa your akong your ama ah or your church your pastors thirdly a mind to do the commandments of god which means a mind a ready mind to obey to obey to do in action one is an attitude obeying obedient spirit is an attitude of the heart that you are willing to obey the other is not only you must must have an attitude of the heart to obey you must also translate that into action once the lord jesus told the parable about two sons the father told the first son to go and do the work in the farming but the son refused then he went and told the other son and the second son said yes i will go but he didn't go but then the first son who initially refused then he went to do the work so now look at the second son he said yes i will do but he didn't do so there was a obedient spirit but the obedient spirit was not followed by an obedient action so you need that also an attitude obedient spirit 
plus an obedient action. So three things, three heart attitude, a pure heart, a clean heart. Secondly, an obedient spirit. And thirdly, a mind to do the commandments of God. So what are the spiritual sacrifices? A priest of the Melchizedek order is required to offer. Number one. To stretch out his hand to give to the poor. To show mercy to the destitute. This is the first sacrifice that a priest is required to give to the poor, to show mercy to the destitute. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6, Micah chapter 6 verse 6 to 8. You know, giving to the poor is an act of sacrifice which pleases God very much. The Lord told the children of Israel in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 22, Always remember the poor. When you harvest your field, leave one portion for the poor. Don't empty the whole field. Remember reading that? He said, leave one portion for the poor. That's where you read about Ruth. Ruth always come to work on the left portion field because she's a very poor, destitute widow, young widow. So God told the children of Israel, Always remember the poor because once upon a time you were slaves in Egypt. So always remember that. You know, as long as you remember that, you will never ever have a pride problem. In the year 2008, one of our partners in Singapore blessed me with a great luxury car. You know? And, uh, in the natural, it would have been impossible for me even if I save up all my lifetime to buy that car. It would have been impossible. But this car was given as a pure gift by this wonderful partner. And on the day when I received the car, I received the keys in my hand. And as I was thanking God for the car, the Lord immediately spoke to me. He said, Each time when you sit in the car, remember the days that you walk in Tibet barefoot. Remember those days. As long as you remember those days, you will never have pride in your heart that you are sitting in a very grand, luxurious car. And from, from that day, each time... As soon as I sit in the car, for a moment before my, my driver starts the car, I remember the days that I walk all over India, all over Tibet, barefoot, the pain that I suffered, the excruciating agony that I suffered with in heat, in cold. Heat was okay, you know. The cold was terrible because the feet swelled three times walking on snow mountains. So I remember all that and saying, thank you Lord for this gift. So this is what God told Israel. Remember that once upon a time you were beggars, you were slaves. Always remember that. When you remember that even now you are surrounded with luxury. You have, you have all the five C's Cash, <laughs> cash, credit card, condominium, what, car and club, ah, not carrot la. <laughs> <laughs> oh, diamond carrot. <laughs> I thought this carrot. <laughs> you know, even if you have all that, but you never, never forget how you were before you got all the Pisces. 
never forget today you know this nation is so blessed like i tell you many times you go to any nation in the world no covered walkway <laughs> each time i come out of my house to go anywhere i just look at all the streets the bus stands now why is the government spending so much of money making walkway why why can't they have just natural freeway <laughs> not freeway free view and you just look at the grass you look at the trees you just walk if it rains rain na so what you got umbrella ma <laughs> if the sun is beating it's okay you got natural sun tan you know then we'll all be the same color <laughs> well even then you have umbrella you know you can still enjoy see no other country in the world the government does all these nice things for you all from the moment you get out of the bus till you go under the block you are just free not a single ray of sunlight can touch you <laughs> guaranteed guaranteed and now the bus stands are becoming a condition ah <laughs> oh look at all the buses a condition you know the sweat from your brow is going to become extinct like the dinosaur <laughs> so much goodness been done for you but this was not how it was 50 years ago or 60 years ago when this nation was founded it was not like that and the, the pioneer ministers mr likwan you and his team how much sweat they sweated they did not earn million dollar salary you know and i don't think they even took 1 dollar salary they fasted they labored in hunger in pain to make this nation to be a prosperous nation today all the second generation third generation though all those who were born after the 70s they would not have seen all the pain all the sufferings that were gone early days were still all these other children born in the 21st century the year 2000 onwards was they are the worst of all <laughs> worst in the sense not that they are all terribly worse you know worse in the sense that they were all born with a silver spoon yes they are all born with a silver spoon or in fact not even with a golden spoon <laughs> they were all born with golden spoon and they know nothing about all, all the difficulty sufferings and they know nothing partly the main culprit is their parents the parents themselves who have gone through sufferings so they say oh i suffered let not my children suffer so even when your children don't ask for a silver spoon you force feed a silver spoon <laughs> actually it's good and bad you know you must also teach your children what it means to suffer then they will know the value of money then they will know the value of respect then they know how to value everything that everything doesn't fall on their laps without working for it so this was what god taught them always remember the poor and give to the poor generously deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 11 give generously to the poor in chennai in our office i always tell my staff we must do some works of charity so every 3 months all the staffs they collect money from their own pocket and they each one of them buy a packet of rice or one packet of food and all the 150 of them they go out in the streets and they will look for a beggar to give food to a beggar or to give clothes to a beggar so once every 3 months they do that and then once a year during christmas time in the past they used to give gifts to one another we have christmas party you know 
So two years ago, I stopped that practice. I said, why instead of giving gifts to one another? Because everybody can afford. So instead of that, each one of you plan a gift to give to a poor, destitute person. So we identify five orphanages. Uh, three orphanages and two is old folks home. We adopt them. So every month we su support them financially. And at the end of the year, during Christmas time, we plan Christmas program. So they, the staff, now this is all not officially funded by the ministry. They use their own pocket money. So I teach them, you know, you must give, you must save treasures in heaven. If the ministry spends the money, ministry will get treasures in heaven. But how are you will be bankrupt in heaven? So you must have some money in heaven. Money is not money, huh? It's treasures. So you need treasures in heaven. So how to get treasures in heaven? By giving to the poor. So then they plan all these games. We'll have a game. So we'll have a drama, skit, everything to entertain all these poor people. Then after that, we give them one grand meal followed by gifts for them. One set of clothing, one set of sari for the woman, one set of uh, what I'm wearing you now like this. Not this color. <laughs> <laughs> for the man, we buy the, for them toothpaste, brush, comb, all their daily necessities. And for the orphan children, we also present them with one set of this pencil, rubber, all these necessaries, stationery that they can use for the new school year. So I thought all my stuffs like that. So they caught the spirit. They, when they caught the spirit, now they themselves begin to do every quarter. They themselves will form a group among themselves. There are 32 departments in our ministry. So each department, they go out on their own. They make a plan. So which part of the city to go and do these works of charity, remembering the poor. So you need to do that too. This is one of the duties of a priest, which will be very, very acceptable unto God. You know, the Lord Jesus himself said, when you throw a feast, don't invite all those who are able. Don't know. Invite those who are not able, the lame, the blind, the deaf, and the dumb, the cripple. Invite them all to your wedding feast or to your birthday party. Now, they cannot return back your gift. They cannot give you any angbao. But they will bless you with all their heart. This is what I told to all my sisters, you know, when their children were getting married. So I told my sisters, let's follow biblical principle. Invite those who are the lame, the blind, the deaf, and the dumb. Because, you know, you all may have a wedding feast or any kind of feast. When you invite those who are able, they are always criticizers. <laughs> oh, this not nice, that not nice. Hey, why like this? Why like that? Am I right? Okay. And then, after criticizing all that, how much angpao they give? Ten dollar. <laughs> but you invite those underprivileged people. They have nothing to give you. So you will not profit anything. Yes. But with all their heart, they will bless your children. They will bless your children with all their heart. They don't care whether there is enough salt or enough, enough pepper. They don't care. Whether there was large quantity or small quantity. They, they don't care. No, To them is they are so blessed and privileged that they are blessed with one nice meal and with all their heart they will bless you and when they bless your children you know what great blessings your children will inherit and their children are going to start a new life and in the new life they will get a ton of blessings rather than a ton of money money can come anytime but blessings you cannot buy you know so do good to the poor thirdly Seek justice. 
relieve the oppressed, care for the fatherless, and defend the widows. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. Seek justice, relieve the oppressed, care for the fatherless, and defend the widows. Now we are still in point number one, but these are just sub points. Number two, the second kind of offering that a priest can offer unto God to be humble and needful before God. That is the second kind of offering. Now this concerns your yourselves, your heart attitude. Psalms 51 verse 17, the King David prays, the sacrifices that you expect are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. So that is a sacrifice. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. Humbleness and humility. Let me give you a very good, perfect example for this. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. The Lord Jesus told a parable about two men who went to the temple to pray. So one was a Pharisee, a church leader. The other was a tax collector. And tax collectors in the Bible days are called sinners. Why they are called sinners? Because they are Jews who are taking tax and interest from the Jewish people. According to the law of Moses, they are not supposed to take interest from their own brethren. So which means, if you loan money to a believer, let's say your own church member, you are not supposed to charge interest to your own fellow brothers and sisters. You give an interest-free loan. But if you are so generous, you have too much of money, you want to give away as a gift, praise God. If you have that kind of intention, give to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and because these tax collectors are breaking the law of Moses, the rest of the Jews consider them as sinners. So these two men went to pray. And when the two men went, now look, look at the first, the tax collector. He stood before the temple, his head bowed down, and he was so broken in heart. He was so ashamed of himself, because everybody calls him a sinner. So he was feeling so demoralized, standing there with a bowed head, didn't know how to pray. He was not even sure whether God will hear his prayer or not. And then on the other side, we have this Pharisee. So wearing nice, his grandoise uniform with his cap, with his shepherd staff. And he was standing there, you know, his heart lifted up because he's Prisma, Pharisee, <laughs> standing there with a grand doors, looking at everybody. His eyes was looking straight towards the temple, you know. And then he looked at this text collector. Hmm, smells. Hmm. Oh, what's that bad? And said, God, I thank you! Because that's how we pray, you know. <laughs> After saying all that, he said, I thank you! I'm not like him! <laughs> See, if you want to pray, you just pray. <laughs> and look what he did. His prayer was not a prayer unto God. His prayer was a prayer of comparison. That is pride. And the text collector, he prayed, Lord, he could hardly hear his own voice. Lord, I'm a great sinner. That was his first sentence. I'm a great sinner. I'm not worthy to even stand here. And the Lord Jesus said, the tax collector's prayer was accepted than the Pharisee's prayer. Why? Because the Pharisees had an attitude of pride was so prideful, so prideful of his righteousness. I think this parable 
is most perfect for Singaporeans. <laughs> because we are like the Pharisee who like to compare ourselves with others all the time. Hey, how many marks did your daughter got? <laughs> you know, my son got A. <laughs> See this heart of comparison. Which school did your son go? Oh, Komlina. Ayyo. My son, na. Go see that one. Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. La. Hey, which you see your son go? Local, na. My son, na. Go see that one. Over the sea. <laughs> you see, this attitude is an attitude of pride. When you compare, comparison is an attitude of pride. If you ever want to compare, there is only one standard with which you should compare. That is the standard of God. Amen. Other than that, if you do any comparison, that is pride. So that is why that is very, very wrong. To be humble and meekful before God. Never, never, never make comparison. Secondly, never, never, ever justify your sins. If you, if you sin, you make a mistake, you fall, don't say, no, you know, Lord, the reason why I did this, don't ever do that. Because before you can justify, God already sees what's your motive of your heart. He already knows the motive of your heart. So if you want forgiveness, don't justify. Just admit you have sinned. Yes, Lord, I have sinned. Don't also say, Lord, I did it unknowingly. Because that's a big bluff. Nobody does unknowingly. Everybody does knowingly. So, when you come before God, don't lie. Don't justify. Just fall prostrate before the presence of God and truly accept your mistake. Accept that you have done wrong. And then say, Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. When you do that, your forgiveness is instantaneous. When you justify, you will get your judgments instantaneously. So don't justify. I learned this from the life of King David. If you read 2 Samuel chapter 11, when the prophet Nathan comes to confront him, as soon as the prophet Nathan pointed his finger at the king, he said, you are the sinner. You know what King David did? Instantly he got up from his throne, he fell on his face and he repented before God. He was a king, you know, king of the whole of Israel. And Nathan is just a prophet. But the king did not care who was looking at him. His cabinet ministers were all seated beside him. He cared not for his own reputation. He was quick to repent. That is why David was always a man after God's heart. Because he never ever justified his sin. He was always quick to repent and be restored back into the love of God. Number three, the third kind of sacrifice, to love the Lord your God with all your heart is the greatest sacrifice a person can give to God. Loving God with all your heart. Mark chapter 12, verse 33. Now please observe the word there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So, it must be a total surrender. It must be a total wholehearted love, not half-hearted. Whatever you do, loving God is a wholehearted thing. When you love God with all your heart, then you will want to do three things. Number one, you want to do that which pleases God. 
John chapter 8 verse 29. The Lord Jesus said, I always do those things that pleases God. Number two, you want to walk in his ways. Exodus chapter 33 verse 13. Psalms 25 verse 4. Thirdly, you want to be obedient to do his commandments. Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 to 19. The Lord Jesus said, I did not come to break the law. I came to fulfill all the law. And in order to enter into the kingdom, you must fulfill all the law. That is doing the commandments of God. Number four, to love God with all your heart also means a surrendered life. You no longer love the ways of the world like how you had liked before. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 where the Apostle Paul says, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. It's two ways, you know. You are dead to the world and the world's appeal on you is also dead, also cut. That is a surrendered life. When you are willing to totally surrender, then I tell you one secret today. You can share it with anybody. <laughs> See, you are expecting me to say the other way, right? Ah, you can share, no problem. The secret is this. No surrender is really a surrender. No surrender is really a surrender. Okay, let me let me justify that. Surrender means you let go, right? So, let me repeat one more time. Let, let this sink into you. No letting go, no surrender is really a surrender. It's really a letting go. In Genesis 22, God calls Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice. That was a surrender, right? Did Abraham eventually sacrifice his son? No. Right? No. Because God stopped him. But what was most important was the attitude of Abraham's heart. That was most important. See, what was God testing him to see was whether his long delayed son has now become an idol in his heart. Many people, this I have seen in many, many believers' lives. You know, they are not married for a long time, suddenly they get married. And when they get married, the marriage now becomes an idol. And then they are not able to conceive a child for a long time. And then through a series of miracles, God touches the woman and blesses her womb with a fruit. She gets a child, then the child becomes an idol. For the sake of the child, now you will give up God. You will give up your call. You will give up your ministry. Some of, some of my staffs have done that. It, it really pained my heart to see how when you had nothing, when all society was looking down on you, I do not know much about Chinese society, but in the Indian society, when a woman doesn't conceive the second month after getting married, she is branded as a, a barren for life. You know, society has all kinds of titles for her. A poor, an Indian girl goes through great harassment and shame and ridicule for not able to conceive in the society. And then if the first year passes by, second year passes by, worse, the humiliation increases. And then if she is condemned for good, which means she is confirmed to be uh, issueless for life, then it's a stigma on her for a long time. Such women, they will pray a prayer like this, you know, Lord, I will do anything for you if you bless my womb. 
and God is good to hear those prayers. He blesses them, and they conceive a wonderful child. And then, uh, then what happens is the child becomes an idol. And for that child, they'll say no to God, no to the ministry. Everything of God becomes now number two, number three, number four. See, that is not a surrendered heart. Now look at Abraham. God tested him. After one hundred years, he got a son. Only son. After that, no more any issue. And God says, out of this uh, will come a great nation. Now God says, kill the son. Contradictory, isn't it? Huh? If you are Abraham, what you would have done? I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> Wouldn't you have done that? Yes. Let's be honest. Yes. You would have done that. Now this cannot be God. How can this be God? God is a giver of life. He gives. He doesn't take away. This is how we justify. You know, we justify like this because we are very, very self-centered in our heart. We are not totally consecrated and surrendered like how Abraham was. Never. See, that's why God sometimes allows this kind of test to come in our lives. Not to test you. Because he already knows you. The test is for you to know yourselves. That's what the test is. For you to see what's in your heart. You know, remember once I said, it's easy to say anything from here. But step out from there. Then see whether you can practice what you are preaching. So when God gives you a test, it's not for him to test you. Because he knows what's inside you. What you will do, what you will make, he already knows. The test is for you to see your own heart, whether you are really who you really are. You can say one thing, but when it comes to practicality, the real stuff, are you the person you really are? You can say from here, don't do this, don't do that. But when your own children do that, can you exercise the justice of God? Or you are going to have double standard. One for the church, one for your own family. There, that's the test, you know. Can you exercise the true judgments of God and blow the line and say, No! I have one system for my family and for the church. One standard system. You know, when my staffs get married, they are not, I don't allow them to take long leaves for 10 days, 15 days, 5 days. The reason why I do that is because, not because I'm evil or wicked, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because I pondered over their lifestyle. If they use up all the 14 days of their leaves, their annual vacation, and then after marriage, emergency comes. What are you going to do? No leave. Then they need to take a leave against loss of pay. Or their wife conceives. They need to bring it to the hospital for checkup. They have no more leaves. What are they going to do? So, thinking about all this, very wise, huh? <laughs> so, I cut their length of their holiday. So, only five days marriage vacation. Only five days. So, they said, no, we have... 14 days. So, yeah, I know you have 14 days. But I only permit you 5 days. So initially they didn't, they were quite upset with me. Say, so, you are preventing us from exercising our right. They <laughs> say, so, it's not a right, it's a privilege. Right? It's a privilege. The company gives you a privilege. It's not a right. So then, the remaining days, then sure enough, you know, they have emergencies. Must do this, must do that. Now they have this backup leaves. Say, I practice what I preach. Can okay, all my family members are here. I have one standard rule. What I preach is what I practice even in my home. You know, anything with the ministry property, I don't use them and neither does my family members use them. When my brother, your pastor, was a young uh, convert, 
our, our church, I founded a church. It was in our home. And all the church equipment was in the home. And you know, now you have CD player. But in those days, they had this Walkman, Sony Walkman. Remember? Yes. See, if you can remember that, <laughs> you are as old as that dinosaur. <laughs> Sony Walkman, no? <laughs> so we have the Sony Walkman. That's a property of the church. So we use that to record prophecies when there's a prophecy that's given. So one day, uh, I cannot remember whether he was already doing his national service or not. Maybe he was still in school. And um, I came back from somewhere and I found him putting on the headphone <laughs> and using the Walkman and listening to some messages. As soon as I saw that, I plucked it from his ears and I gave him a good scolding. How dare you use, you use the church property? This is not your personal property. This is not my property. It's a church property. How can you use that? He said, but I'm just using it for religious purpose. No matter what purpose, it's not your property. This is a standard I practice. One, one standard, not two standard. You see me laughing, I laugh. You see me serious, I'm serious. What you see is what you get. See? We, Abraham, so God tests us to make you see what is in your heart. Is it gold, silver, bronze, or wood, stubble, or hay? What is your heart? That's why tests come. So when tests come, the first, your first reaction is, lift up your hand and say, praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for giving me an opportunity to see my own heart. What will you do in any given situation? When the rubber hits the road, when you need to make a choice between God or your dreams, which will you choose? When you need to obey God or follow the love of your life, surrender. Can you surrender? Easy to say, yes, I will do. Practically? But when you are willing to let go, then you will receive back from God good measure, pressed down, shaken together, flowing over. That's what God does. You know the saying, no one can outgive God. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that, right? You cannot outgive God. Because God always undones you. So, to love God with all your heart means a surrendered life. You want to live, act, and behave like how God wants you to. That doesn't mean a robotic lifestyle. But it's the right life. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17. When the Lord Jesus was baptized, he heard the father's voice saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because you live such a life that was so pleasing to God. So he is well pleased with God. Thirdly, you will then seek, search God's will and design all things for your daily life to be like the Lord Jesus' life. Like how he lived. John chapter 5 verses 19 to 20. I always seek to do that which the Father does. Whatever the Father does, I see and I do. See, then all the works of your hands will be perfect. Then whatever you do will always be successful. You know, sometimes we think that when you live such a surrendered life, it may mean that you cannot enjoy life. I tell you one thing from my, what I learned from my personal work with God. I always say this, God is a good God. In fact, two good or three good. You, even the goodness of God cannot be undone or outdone. That's how good a God is. You know, his, the scripture says in Luke chapter 11, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
how much more your father in heaven you, you know you let this word sink inside you if an evil father or an evil mother will think good for their children will want to good, do good for their children if the evil people themselves can do good how much more a good father in heaven how much more he will do more than good for all his dear children so if he is going to do more than good for all whatever you sacrifice is not a sacrifice whatever you surrender is not a surrender whatever you give is not a gift because god multiplies back many many fold more in your life you know i tell you one thing if the lord jesus christ can return something that someone gave him like when he died joseph of arimathea donated his own grave to the lord jesus and the lord jesus returned it back to him right why you are look at me as if i am saying things from outer space okay let me rephrase again when the lord jesus died he needs to be buried right okay their burial system is they put in um, a cave right a tomb that's the burial tomb now the lord jesus christ never had any property no money no property no home no house nothing and because his family is so very poor where is he going to get money to buy a grave a tomb so no money right but during his 3 and 1/2 years ministry among his many followers there were also very rich people if you read luke chapter 8 verses 1 2 and 3 there were a group of eight women who were part of the ministry team of the lord jesus you know very sadly only the 12 disciples are always mentioned by name but there were eight women who always traveled together with the lord jesus christ and among the eight women there were three of them who were the financial contributors to the ministry of the lord jesus so they were wealthy people who were contributing financially so there were also wealthy people among the team among the disciples and the people who followed the lord jesus and joseph of arimathea was one of them he was a very man of great stature standing in the society very wealthy man the wealthy people have very large tombstone they dug out of a cave and that is their family you know so they bury all the father mother son grandson they bury them all together in one place so joseph of arimathea donated his grave his tomb the brand new tomb to the lord jesus to be buried so if you if you bury somebody there means is gone for good am i right everybody yes. ah gone for good but look at what the lord jesus did you give me something i give you back good measure pressed on shaken together hang on take back your grave <laughs> You know, the Lord Jesus did not just give back an empty grave; He gave an sanctified grave. Amen. Look at that sanctified grave. Who was there? The Son of God. Amen. Doesn't it make it special? Can sell it for a huge amount, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Can name on no auction? The highest bidder. Sanctified grave. Sanctified grave used by none other than the Lord Jesus Himself. Look at that! If he can return back a grave, what he cannot give back to you? Yeah. Amen? Amen. So, whatever you surrender is not really a surrender. The Lord will only sanctify your surrender and purifies the surrender and makes it better for you. Number five. Now, who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek, his name comes from two, Melchi plus Sedek. Melchi means king, who is ruler, someone who reigns and who subjugates the enemies. So that's what the word Melchi means. Likewise, a priest of the order of Melchizedek should be a person. 
who subjugates all sinful impulses within you and you reign over them see you exercise your kingly authority you reign over your sinful impulses romans chapter 6 verses 12 to 14 secondly look at the word sadak sadak means righteousness so the priest of the melchizedek order is a person who reigns over himself that itself is the righteousness being righteous before god you have been righteous because once you stop sinning all the works of your hands are become righteous number 2 then your ways your work before god will be righteous and number 3 and all the works of your hands will be regarded will be works of righteousness and incidentally when you begin to do all that that fulfills a very important part of the bride in revelation chapter 19 verse 8 it says the garment that the bride wears is a fine linen garment and is called the righteousness of the saints have you ever wondered why it is not called the righteousness of god it's called the righteousness of the saints you know i pondered that for many many years you know why is it called like that i thought maybe there was an error in the bible it should be the righteousness of god but even the many translations of the bible that i studied it all says the same thing righteousness of the saints so why does it say righteousness of the saints because you are required to do works of righteousness the works of god in matthew chapter 5 verse 20 the lord jesus said if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the pharisees and the sadducees you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven so what is the righteousness of the pharisees the righteousness of the pharisees is very self centered righteousness very self righteous righteousness a very boastful righteousness and they very meticulous about every detail 10% types must be 10% cannot be 11% or 9.9% must be right on the dot now the lord jesus said your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the pharisees which means you must give more than what you is required out of you don't just stick to 10 if you stick to 10 god measures 10 for you because if you stick to 10 he measures for you remember you cannot outgive god you i challenge you today as i challenge all my viewers in india you try to give 15% 20% of your tithes to god you do that he will multiply if you give 20 he gives you 40 you give 30 you 60 that is not gambling huh? <laughs> ah this is not gambling we shouldn't also have that attitude that is wrong you give out of a joyful heart because you want to give because god has blessed you too much when he has blessed you too much it is a rightful thing for us to give back to god so that there will be meat in the house of god for the poor for the salvation of souls so those are the spiritual sacrifices that we need to offer now let's look at another aspect of the melchizedek priesthood there is a greater sacrifice and a greater offering that is required out of the melchizedek priesthood sacrifices yes that's also important but there is something that is greater than that if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 
the apostle Paul details about all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then as he came to the last verse in chapter 12, he says, but I show you a better way. Do you remember that? In the same manner, we do all these sacrifices as a priest, but there is a greater sacrifice, a greater offering that is expected and required out of a priest. What is it? Psalms chapter 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you did not require. Now look at the scripture again. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. So what does that mean? More than sacrifices, more than offerings, God requires his priests to have an understanding heart and an obedient spirit. That's what it means. My ears you have opened. Why open the ears for? So that you can have an understanding heart and an obedient spirit. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed, listen, than the fat of rams. So, a greater sacrifice that is required out of the Melchizedek priesthood, which means all of you, is having your ears open so that you can have an understanding heart, a listening ear and an obedient spirit. God requires the priests to obey his voice. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 23. But this is what I commanded them saying, Obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people. And walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Now this comes from having the years of your understanding open. Only then the kingly priest can truly hear what God is saying and execute in righteous judgment. Some years ago, maybe I think this was in the year 2011, God called me to lead a small group to do a prayer walk around Israel. So I took a team of about seven people. We went to do a prayer walk all around Israel. But before we did the prayer walk, we fasted and prayed for three days to get the plans from God where and how to do the prayer walk. So during the three days of fasting and prayer, one day, while I was praying, I fell into a trance. In the trance, I saw that I was somewhere and it, there was a rocky mountain on my left side and there was a sea on my right side and a narrow path just down the rocky mountain that would lead slowly by the cliff of the rock, by the side of the rock mountain that followed by the sea. So I was standing by the path there and I saw on the opposite side a saint from heaven. So he came and stood there and he said, I want to test your hearing, whether your hearing is correct, open or not open. So I didn't understand what he was saying, you know. Okay, I understood what he said. I want to test your hearing. I wonder why he want to test my hearing because I could hear what he is speaking to me. So when I, when I could hear, see, this is a heavenly saint. So why? I didn't know. So he had an instrument like a triangle. Have you seen these musicians use a triangle? They ting, tong, and then the waves, they use that to tune their instrument. So he had something like that, you know. And he took that and he threw into the sea. When he threw into the sea, he said, look straight at me and tell me what you hear. When it fell into the water, I heard the sound. Pong. I turned and looked into the very direction where he threw that triangle into. So as soon as I turned and I saw, 
he took he took note oh, okay his ears are open okay he can hear now pass pass i didn't understand what it all signified you know only later on the lord explained to me to go another higher level that was a test for you to be promoted to the next level your ears need to be tested whether your ears can hear and obey what god will tell you to do that is a year for not listening a year of understanding an understanding heart a listening ear see only then so your ears must be open only then the kingly priest can truly hear what god is saying and execute in a righteous manner you cannot do things opposite to what god is saying you cannot presume that this is what god is saying that's why your ears must be open so you must pray lord open my ears open my ears that not just spiritual ears no what you must pray is pray for an understanding heart say you must pray lord give me an understanding heart then you will clearly discern what god is speaking to you not roughly not i think it you see a rope ah i think it's a snake <laughs> not like that not like that have you remember the story about the five blind men who saw an elephant yes. do you remember yes. okay if you can remember this <laughs> pity you <laughs> you are as old as the dinosaur <laughs> because today the story is extinct so the five men who touched the elephant and they said oh this look like a pillar the leg look like a pillar then they touched the body oh this is a wall and then they touched the tail this is a rope see that's how you will misinterpret your vision or your dream and when you misinterpret everything goes wrong so that's why you must have an understanding heart and a listening ear so pray for that lord give me an understanding heart so that i can understand what you are speaking to me in second chronicles chapter 1 verse 10 we read that king solomon asked god for wisdom and understanding to rule wisely so why do you need that why do you need an understanding heart psalms chapter 40 verse 8 gives us the answer such an understanding heart will then delight to do the will of god i delight to do your will o oh my god and your law is within my heart now after you have the understanding heart the ability to hear and understand with the spiritual eye yes depend now let me let me put it very slowly again the ability to hear and understand with the spiritual ears depends on the depth and the distance of your relationship with god you understand this statement see it depends and also it depends on now you have heard of iq intelligence question have you heard of eq emotion question but today i teach you something new oq obedient question oq oq is found in heaven iq is okay you be dumb also never mind <laughs> god can still use donkeys you know donkeys to speak so the your ability to hear and understand with your spiritual ears is dependent on your distance the depth of the distance of your relationship with god and your obedient question you can hear the strongest and the clearest if you are the closest to the ark of the covenant exodus chapter 25 verse 22 God says 
I will speak to you from between the wings of the cherubim on the ark. So that's where God's voice is going to sound. So if that's where God's voice is going to sound, the clearest you can hear, the clearest and the loudest is when you are very close to the ark. That's number one. So the closest. Number two, you can hear the strongest and the clearest when you are still in the presence of God. Still, quiet. Psalms 46 verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. If you do all the noise, if you make all the noise before God, how are you going to hear what he is speaking to you? So after praying all that you need to pray, be quiet. If you want to hear God, or you want to see a vision, you must be still and quiet. If you are not still and quiet, you cannot see. So the quality of the strength of hearing is dependent on the equidistance to the ark. Let's suppose the ark is at this end of the stage and you are at this end of the tabernacle. So there's a big gap between you and the ark. And the voice of God is sounded there. So how are you going to hear when you are here? Okay, six steps. Number one, the place at the brazen altar. If, if your level is there, that is the furthermost from the ark where the sound is very faint. Very faint. Now what takes place on the brazen altar? Burning. So, what is the sound of burning? Crackles of fire, right? When you, what can you hear? Fire burning. The wood, little crackle, little, little crackle. So that's what you hear. Oh, from there, this is what you hear. Now the second stage, the lever of washing. So in the lever of washing, what do you hear? Splashes of water. Now how, how much loud sound can you hear? Splashing of water. Little sound because distance is still far. Then you go to the holy place, the lampstand. Now in the lampstand, your hearing is enhanced by the light. The light now gives you understanding. Your hearing is enhanced. Now then you come to the place of the showbread. In the showbread, your hearing is enhanced by understanding. Psalms 119 verse 105 and 130. The entrance of thy word gives me understanding. So the word is the bread. The bread is the word. So when it enters in, it gives you understanding. Then from there you progress to the next stage. Incense. Here incense, the sound gets a little louder now. The burning of the incense. Louder, your hearing now comes with smell. Now what is smell? Discernment. Now you can discern clearly what God is speaking to you. Finally, you stand before the Ark of the Covenant. When you stand before the Ark of the Covenant, what do you have? A 4D experience. 4D experience means 4 dimensional experience. What is a 4 dimension? Seeing Sight, sound, smell, feel. Sight, sound, smell, feel. The 4D experience. That's full clarity. The full sound, full blast of the sound you will hear when you are before the Ark of the Covenant. You know, in 1983, I was praying very ardently every day to hear the voice of God. So every day, I got up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I was, I was teaching, I had a full-time job at that time, no? but I was so desperate to see God, to hear the voice of God. So from 2 o'clock up to 5 o'clock in the morning, I worship God, I pray, then I meditate the word, then I wait on God. So this went on for months. I remember I started on this discipline in the month of April 1983. <coughs> So it went on right up to August. But during those months, 
I had little, little dreams, little, little, little things. Not something very great to to testify today. But I kept on praying every day. Lord, I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to hear. Not just voice, no audible voice. See, there's a difference. To if you just pray, Lord, I want to hear voice. It can be a still small voice. Or you didn't specify. So much specify audible voice. Audible voice is like how you are hearing my voice now, like someone standing right beside you and talking to you. So I prayed like that every day. One day in September. So after praying, I looked at my clock. Okay, five o'clock finish. I I just wanted to lie down for a while before I got ready to go to school. So as soon as my head touched the pillow. I heard a loud boom sound. It was as if big speakers, like this size, big speakers, put on the four corners of my room, and the voice boom through the four corners of my room. But when I look around, I couldn't exactly pinpoint where exactly the source of the voice, the sound was coming from. Like right now, I can tell you that my voice is coming from this speaker box. I can point a finger, but when God speaks. You can never point a finger and say where the voice was coming from, and God spoke. First time I heard the audible voice of God for 15 minutes, the Lord spoke to me about my ministry, where I needed to go, what I needed to do. He spoke. That was the first time I had this full audible voice of God. So this is what I mean. Now, okay, I must tell you something. For the experience, right? So one, I heard the audible voice. Secondly, I also heard the sound of running waters, like a stream of waters flowing together. And I was wondering where is this rushing water coming from? And there was a sound of waters. Third, there was music. And fourth, there was an experience of an awe, a feeling of awe that you want to bend your knees and bow and humble yourselves before the presence of the Almighty God. Four D experience. Loudest and the clearest. So you must strive to have a closer, closer relationship with God. You are starting from here, from the altar of burnt sacrifice, and you go closer and closer and closer. Your ultimate goal should be abiding in the most holy place before the ark of the covenant. That should be your goal. Is it possible or not possible? possible. Absolutely possible. Yes. Make that your goal. That by the December 2018, you will dwell there. Amen. 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 Is it possible? Yes. Absolutely possible. Yes. If you are willing, you will eat the good of the land. Amen. The Bible promises. As a priest progresses. In his understanding of hearing and doing God's will, he will also progressively progress in doing the works of God. Which means, God will then begin to entrust you with greater responsibilities. He will begin to promote you from one level to another level to another level. Ordinary priest offering burnt sacrifice, then he promotes you. You become a priest in the holy place, and you turn into the lampstand and the table showbread, and then burning of the incense. Then he promotes you because only the high priest can go into the most holy place. He promotes you, and you stand in the most holy place, not once, not twice, all the days of your life. Amen. I tell you one secret: if you experience something once. It is open for you for good. Amen. It's open for you good. The key has been given into your hands, Amen. so you can open the door any time you like. Amen. That is the privilege God gives to all His beloved children. Amen. Now, greater degree at that level, greater degree of purity and cleanness of hands and feet are required. As you progress from one level to another level to another level, Psalms fifteen, verse two. 
Psalms 24 verse 4. So, greater degree of purity and cleanness of hands and feet are required. But, when you come and stand before the ark, God requires something more than hands and feet. The heart attitude to be humble and pure. All, all the other while, you can get by with some little, little sins in your life or little, little shortcomings in your life. But when you progress to the most holy place, then God will deal with the issues of your heart. Nothing will escape his eyes. If you want to dwell there, then you must be pure. Your heart must be pure. And you must have an attitude of humility and meekness. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. Why? Because God now sees directly your heart. You can see him. He can see you. Now that brings us to the next level. A kingly priest dwelling place should be in the most holy place. A priest of the order of the Melchizedek. You should not be dwelling at the outer court. Your place is not even in the holy place. Your place is in the most holy place. Because you are a king, you are a priest. That's where you should be. In Zechariah chapter 6 verse 13, we read that the Lord Jesus sits on the throne as a king and as a priest. And when Samuel was a small boy, three to five years old. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 3, he was always sleeping in the most holy place before the Ark of the Covenant. That's where he was sleeping. That's where he was dwelling all the time. That's why he rose up to be a great prophet that the Bible says none of his words fell to the ground unfulfilled because he was always dwelling there. That's his favorite place. And what makes King David very, very dear to the heart of God? Psalms 26 verse 8. Psalms 27 verse 4. King David always longed to be in the house of God all the days of his life. He was a king and for him they desired to be in the house of God that was being a priest. King David being a kingly priest. That is why we are required according to 2 Corinthians 7 1 to be clean and holy in the spirit and in the soul. Now, if you are going to dwell in the most holy place, there is something you need to do. You must prepare your heart when coming before God. Each time you come into the house of God, prepare your heart. Don't just come anyhow. Yeah, it's a Sunday service. But in a Sunday service, like I told you earlier, you're not just coming here to mark attendance or play games in your church. No, you're coming to a church to meet with God. Earlier on, one of our elders, when he was praying for offering, he prayed a prayer that, God will speak to the speaker. He didn't pray, Lord, let the speaker preach a wonderful message. He didn't pray like that. He prayed, Lord, speak to the speaker. You remember that? Yes. So he was asking God to speak. So you are coming before God to meet with God. So if you are coming to meet with God, your heart must be prepared before you come into the house of God. You prepare your heart at home. Then you come to meet with God. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. Ezra prepared his heart. Now look at the word prepared. What does the word prepared mean? The word prepared in the Hebrew, now all Chinese will love this. It means kum. Kum, kum. 
Kun K U W N but Kun is not sleeping that's only for chinese okay only for kin but in the hebrew kun means to be erect see the opposite of okay <laughs> to be erect stand perpendicular now to be erect and stand perpendicular against what against the standards of god so the standards of god is the plumb line so you put yourself straight against you are your heart is prepared against the standards of god so you check your heart is my heart clean is my mind clean is everything clean and then you pray lord speak to me i'm going to your house today help me to worship you with an obedient heart with a free heart let me give out of an abundance of heart joyfully not grudgingly you do all your homework at home before you come to church so the standards what are the standards of god righteousness and holiness the high priest first offers sacrifice for himself set to sanctify him before he offers sacrifices for the whole of israel in leviticus chapter 9 verse 7 Hebrews chapter 5 verse 3 and chapter 9 verse 7 so he does he prepares himself first before he does offer sacrifices for others so what does that mean the cleansing of the heart you analyze your heart for any known sin or unknown sin before you come before god so that you are not killed you know high priest if he doesn't cleanse himself if he comes before god in the holy place even with a little dust bit of sin in his life he will instantly be killed leviticus chapter 16 verses 12 to 13 so don't be like king rehobam king rehobam the bible tells us in second chronicles chapter 12 verse 14 did not prepare his heart to meet with god so don't be like that instead you should pray like this first chronicles chapter 29 verse 18 pray and ask god ask the holy spirit to prepare your heart to meet with god so every day even in your personal prayer before you start praying this is what i do you know before i even sit down before prayer i first pray and ask the holy spirit to help me to meet with god then after that i start praying so you prepare your heart cleanse your heart of every known sin unknown sin cleanse your mind with all the rubbish of the activities of the day cleanse everything you come before god clean so that you will you will put on the robe clean and white when you stand before god so how to prepare the heart now we talk about preparing now the next question is how to prepare the heart jeremiah chapter 4 verse 3 for thus says the lord to the men of juda and jerusalem break up your fellow ground and do not sow among thorns so how to prepare your heart break up the fellow ground so your heart is like a field and a good example to for that is a parable of the sower matthew chapter 13 verses 19 to 23 in the parable of the sower there were three kinds of soil condition or other four kinds we don't need to look at the last one because the last one is good ground so forget about that Let's look at the first three. The first three are the bad ones. Wayside. Secondly, among stony ground, and thirdly, among thorns. These are the three. So, what are the three? These are the three conditions of your heart. Wayside means a, a careless and indifferent attitude. 
So you may agree that one time or another, we all had that kind of an attitude, callous, indifferent attitude. You come before God's presence to pray, very callous attitude, chincha chincha. <laughs> See, very bad. So you want to get rid of that attitude. You know, never, never forget one thing. You are coming before a holy God. Don't forget that. As much as He is a good God, you are coming before a holy God, even at home. When you, the moment you kneel down to pray, or you sit down, or you squat down, or you prostrate, whatever your position is, the moment you pray, you are coming before a holy God. So when you are coming before a holy God, you cannot have an indifferent, callous attitude. So that's the first thing you want to correct your heart. In order, you, when you come to prepare your heart, so check your heart to see if there is callousness, if there is indifference. Number two, stony ground. Now what is a stony ground? It is an attitude of rebellion. Heart, heart. So you want to deal, look at your heart. Is there any rebellion in my heart? What is rebellion? You may think rebellion. What is rebellion? Disobedience is rebellion. That's what the Bible says. Disobedience is rebellion. So you want to clear all the stones from your heart. Number three, thorns. Some seed fell by the thorns and the thorns grew and they began to choke the seed and kill the very life of the seed. Now what are thorns? Thorns represents three things. Number one, the cares of this world. The cares of this world are the worries that we go through. What to eat, what to drink, what to wear. Every morning you get up, you have this problem. What to wear today? Right? I don't have this problem at all. <laughs> I never have this problem at all. My nephew, you know, my nephew, my niece, seated over there, she told me, so I asked her the other day, how is life in the poly? Oh, she said, uh, fun and not so fun. I asked her, why not fun? She said, every day I must think what to wear. <laughs> what? So when you're in the school, no problem, no all standard uniform. So I told her, okay, listen to uncle's advice. Huh? Golden advice. This is what I did when I was teaching in the school. You know, I had standard uniform. Every, every Monday I have one standard color that I wear. So I have four shirts, two pants. Black pants matches any color. Right? It matches any color. Black shoes matches any. So I had one pair of shoes. And two pants. That's all the money I had to buy, you know. So, and four or five shirts. I think five shirts. Every day must one color. So every Monday I wear blue color. <laughs> now blue color was Thursday. Thursday was my favorite day. So, <laughs> not today, huh? Those were, oh, those were ancient times. Why Thursday was my favorite day? Because all my favorite programs have come on TV on Thursday. <laughs> So that Thursday became my favorite day. So Monday, purple. Tuesday, I don't know what color. So every day one color. So so much so, all my students, they memorize what color I wear. You know? <laughs> one particular day, I went to the, I just took, changed the color. I went to the classroom and said, Sir, how come you are wearing the wrong color today? <laughs> So the cares of this world, what to wear, what to eat, what to do, those are the thorns that are choking you. So when you sit in prayer, they come and choke you. What to wear, what to eat, are you, you see, eat, wearing are the daily necessities of life. And God promises you, you know, you don't need to pray for that, he said. He said, it will be given to you because those are the daily necessities of life. 
your father in heaven will provide for you. Don't worry. So the key is, don't worry. So let not worries crowd you. Number two, deceitfulness of riches. What does that mean? Guard your heart from the love of money. You know, money is necessary. Without money, we cannot survive. You need money to pay for the rent of this church. You need money to buy all these nice things you see in this wonderful church. You need money for all that. However, money is not the root of all evil. Love for money is the root of all evil. <coughs> money should be your servant, not your master. So, that's number two. Number three, pleasures of life. Luke chapter 8 verse 14, you'll find that word there. Pleasures of life. So, what are pleasures of life? The word pleasures in the Greek is hedone. H-E-D-O-N-E. And hedone means sensual delight. Sensual delight also, it means two things. One is lustful desires. Secondly is pleasurable desires of the world. You need to be careful of that too. All that are good, you know, if they are extracurricular activities. Extracurricular activities should not become the main activities of your life. See, even the schools call it extra. They don't call it the main because the main is studying, right? So they keep it in focus. That is extra. Playing games, going on vacation, having fun in a church, this party, that party, that is should be ECA. Not the main activity of the church. So these are the thorns that are choking you. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of life. So you want to remove out all these thorns and you prepare your heart. So this is the way how your, you can prepare yourselves to come to meet with God. Now, conclusion. You know, every time when I start this topic, I always ask God one question. I, you know, till today, I am still not satisfied with one, uh, one question in my heart. What is the real purpose of the Melchizedek priesthood Lord? I keep on, I still keep on asking God the same question over and over again. Finally, I found the answer today. While the worship was going on, the Lord showed me what was or what is the ultimate purpose for the Melchizedek priesthood, for the order to raise up a Melchizedek priesthood in these last days. What is the purpose? The purpose is so that you, each individual, can minister unto God in heaven. That's the purpose. Minister unto God in heaven. You will be a king and a priest in heaven. So when, when this was shown to me, immediately I saw a vision. In the vision I saw the 24 elders in heaven. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying that 24 elders in heaven, now that was a mystery that every theologian is trying to wrestle with who the 24 elders are. So over the last year, years, many, many years, the 24 elders, they have so many different interpretations for that. One school says the 24 is divided into two groups, 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament, 12 apostles from the New Testament. If that was correct, now John was in heaven. So he could have seen his double in heaven. <laughs> right? That's wrong because he did not recognize his double there. Not multi-universe, you know. Ah, there's only one single universe. And that single universe is in the spiritual realm. Anyway, we'll not go into that science. So, so who are the 24 elders? So this is what the Lord revealed. The 24 elders represents the 24 orders of the Melchizedek priesthood. 
You know, you'll be amazed when King David established the priesthood, there were 24 divisions of the priesthood. Now, where did he get the revelation to set apart 24 divisions of the priesthood? It came from heaven. It was revealed to him. Each one of the elders represents the 24 orders of the priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood. And then the Lord showed me evidences for that. Now, if you read Revelation chapter 4 verse 10, you will find all the 24 elders wearing a crown and sitting on a throne. Now, that represents kingly position. Am I right? Yes. Only a, someone who is kingly will sit on a throne and wear a crown. Number 2. Now, you need to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. This is the ultimate proof of what I just told you. Revelation chapter 5 and verses 8 to 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the four, 24 elders fell down before the th lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So the elders are holding the bowls of the prayers, so which means they are priests, right? So kings and priests. Now let's go on, you'll find it very interesting. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now look at verse 10. And have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So there you go. The 24 elders saying, you have made us kings and priests. That is the order of the Melchizedek. So that scripture gives you an answer. The twofold purpose of the Melchizedek priesthood. To be a king and priest in heaven and king and priest on the earth at the same time. Amen. Amen. Is, is that written there very clearly, right? Mm -hmm. And shall reign on the earth. Mm -hmm. So you are reigning in heaven and on the earth at the same time. That's the ultimate purpose that God is raising up an army, an order of the priesthood Melchizedek. So, earlier on our pastor made a very important statement that we should not just be people of hearers, but we should be doers. Now that, now that you have been, you have heard and been taught, 